So good, good morning again. Uh, welcome to the panel on uh, Europe, Ukraine, and Russia. Um, we have very impressive panelists with us today. Let me start with Simeon Jenkov, who will talk to us about Europe. Uh, Simeon has been an advisor to our center for a long time. And um, he wrote in the Atlas the, the chapter on, on Europe, and also together with uh, Joseph Lemoine and myself, an overview of, uh, the, um, um, of the Atlas chapters. Uh, Simeon is a Bulgarian economist. Um, between 2009 and 2013, he was Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance of Bulgaria. Uh, before that, he was um, actually, I think, the youngest um, chief economist uh, of um, what they call the vice presidency um, at the World Bank. Uh, it was the vice presidency for finance in the private sector. Uh, at the World Bank, he led several important projects such as Women, Business and the Law, the World Development Reports and Doing Business. He was associate editor of the Journal of Comparative Economics mm -hmm. and he is currently the, uh, the director of the Financial Markets Group at the London School of Economics. Uh, we have remotely um, Yuri Gorodnichenko, who was born in Ukraine, is an economist and uh, Quant Edge presidential professor at the University of California uh, at Berkeley. Um, he's also a visiting scholar at the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco and is associated with several other prestigious research institutions. He's a, uh, a co-editor of the Journal of Monetary Economics. His work was published in leading economics journals around the world, and he received many awards for his teaching and research. And he has quite a remarkable recognition, uh, an organization called REPEC, which stands for Research Papers in Economics, ranks Korotnichenko as the top young economist in the world. Konstantin Sonin was born in Russia. He's also an economist in recognition for his outstanding research in the field of political economy. Uh, in December 2015, he was named the John Dewey Distinguished Service Professor at the University of Chicago. He's a research fellow at the Center for Economic Policy, uh, Economic Policy Research SEPR in London and many other research institutions. He was um, the vice rector of the Higher School of Economics, a public research university in Moscow, but was forced to resign by the Putin authorities. He published in leading economic journals, and um, he has the great distinction. Actually, I'm pretty jealous for this. He is uh, on the federal wanted list in Russia mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and for uh, disclosing information um, on the Bucha massacre and the siege of Mariupol uh, that was in 2023 and that was not enough. So in 2024, an arrest warrant was issued for him in Russia. Um, and last but not least, Merinda Herring is um, an expert on Ukraine, but also on Eurasia matters in general. She is a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council Eurasia Center, uh, where she was a deputy director until recently. She's the author of several reports, including reforming the bureaucracy, the democracy bureaucracy. Um, and in 2017, she was a contributor to a volume entitled Does Democracy Matter, uh, which was published by Roman and Littlefield. So, um, the first question will go to Simeon, who wrote the, the chapter on the European Union in our atlas. Um, Europe has been scoring above the global averages on both freedom and prosperity for the past 28 years, but um, several indicators have stagnated since 2014. Mm -hmm. What's going on? Um, well, what's going on, Fred actually at uh, dinner last night summarized it, uh, Fred Kempe, I think, quite well, which is that there has been a recession in liberties globally. Um, Europe, of course, starts from a very high position, so we don't necessarily think of uh, Europe as a place that we should worry about uh, either democracy or um, 
liberal economics, but in a number of countries, as the report that we are launching today suggests, there actually has been a, a recession over the last uh, roughly um, decade. Um, it truly started with the Eurozone crisis, a financial crisis in 2008-2009, then a number of southern European countries got into trouble, um, um, Greece, our neighbor and from Bulgaria, Portugal, uh, Spain, uh, France to some extent, and so on. And then the population, as Daron was just talking about, started recalculating the values of, uh, of uh, liberties more generally, both democracy as well as uh, economic liberties. Uh, so that's how really it started, and that's why I'm not surprised that in your data done in the Atlas from 2014, you see first a leveling, and then a decrease in... Um, in uh, some of the freedom uh, indicators. Uh, also this morning, Fred mentioned that uh, uh, many countries around the world, around two billion people, have uh, elections this year. I should note that all of Europe has uh, uh, an election coming uh, in about <coughs> three months, uh, the election for the European Parliament, which uh, until very recently, most countries were not really counting as a real election because you have the national elections and then you send some people to, um, to uh, Brussels. Uh, done, but I think this uh, this year's the election uh, the elections are very important for two reasons. One, because of the overall European policy on Ukraine, mm. which is of course the assistance to Ukraine, but also how Europe itself gets organized on many issues like uh, um, uh, the military uh, structure of uh, the Union, which is essentially absent uh, mm. until uh, now. So, what do you do about this common? Um, foreign policy, which exists here and there, but again, is uh, not very strong. So what has uh, the war in Ukraine has galvanized uh, some uh, uh, movement towards common policies, but the next uh, uh, European Parliament and European Commission that will be selected based on this uh, Parliament has a lot to say about this. And I just want to finish with this thought, just as we worry about uh, the recession in uh, democracy in a number of um, large uh, uh, emerging markets, so we worry about Europe, because in the last year, two years, but certainly from the last European elections, you have had, um, shall we say, conservative governments, um, uh, right-wing governments in the Netherlands, in Italy, in a number of the very large, important countries of the European Union. So I do worry whether 2024 would be another inflection point in, um, in the political as well as economic history of Europe. Thank you, Celia. Well, I would like um, to ask Yuri the next question. <clears throat> Thank you, Yuri, for writing the chapter on Ukraine um, in our atlas. Our um, center did an interesting comparison between countries in Eastern Europe where some of them uh, chose to join the European Union and chose economic, political, legal freedom and countries that did not. Ukraine did not. And the numbers for Ukraine, looking historically, these 28 years uh, that we are covering in our uh, historical da data, show a complex mm -hmm. uh, picture for Ukraine. Would you care to elaborate on that, please? Thank you. And uh, thank you for inviting me to join this very exciting project and this conference. And I'm sorry for not being able to join this in person. Um, Ukraine has a very long, very complicated history, and maybe not surprisingly, it also has a very volatile uh, trajectory. Uh, just you know, to set the perspective here, you know, think about what was happening on the Ukrainian side. In 1991, Ukraine got uh, or regained its independence, and it was a dream for many, many uh, generations of Ukrainians. But at the same time, you have to fight the Soviet legacy and the mentality of fears of influence, not just in Ukraine, but uh, everywhere else. And so when you look at Ukraine, you see lots and lots of people in the early 90s who never traveled to Europe. They didn't know how life would be. All they saw was, you know, the Soviet repression, the misery and so on. And so many people just didn't have any idea how life can look for them if they join Europe. So there was less demand uh, to move in that direction. Also remember at that time in the 90s and even after that, there was a very strong influence of communist ideas, basically ranging from, uh, you know, red directors running the country. For example, former president Leonid Kuchma was one of these red directors to basic popular expectations that all social services have to be provided for free to everybody. That's obviously not sustainable. 
and to overcome this legacy, this baggage, uh, to reestablish European aspirations. Ukraine had to have basically two revolutions. The Orange Revolution in 2004, and then another revolution in 2013, 2014, the Revolution of Dignity. This last revolution was, you know, a, a point, a tipping point. You know, after this, Ukraine did many reforms, and the movement towards the European Union became irreversible. But this is sort of on the Ukrainian side. We have a lot of action there since 2013. You look at the European side, and you very quickly realize that very few people understood Ukraine back then in the 90s, and even as recently as you know early 2000s. So basically, you know, frankly, you ask people in the West to put Ukraine on the map before the full-scale Russian invasion, and they would struggle. Now it's obvious that you know Ukraine is there, and it's a different country, but it wasn't like that for many years. In fact, you know, many experts were really. <laughs> Uh, on Ukraine, we are really experts on, on Russia rather than Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at, you know, policymakers, you look at the experts, you look at the general public, they all believe that Ukraine is a part of the Russian sphere of influence. And again, just as a reminder, you know, how strong that is, we go to 1991, where President Bush was in Kyiv, and he delivered a speech, which was called a uh, chicken Kyiv speech. Uh, uh, this was just a few weeks before Ukraine declared independence, and he was basically saying that Ukraine should not do this. It's suicide and nationalism. And we have this, you know, situation for many, many years, when Ukraine became a sort of a no-man's land, when people didn't care enough in the West about Ukraine because that's so, it's a part of Russia. And so as a result, uh, Ukraine was um, sort of an object that was easy to sacrifice to build or reload relations with Russia. That was an unfortunate situation. And so as a result, you have this dynamic equilibrium, if you will, a no man's land, where you know Ukraine is not ready, Europe is not ready, and Ukraine didn't have internal capacity after 1991 to uh, make you know a sustained effort to join the European Union. And also, Europe didn't have enough uh, interest in Ukraine, and so Ukraine didn't have an external institutional anchor to make this move, unlike some other countries in the region, like Poland, Hungary, and so on. And um, so that's a difficult situation, but, you know, it's very clear now that Ukraine is a democratic country. We had six presidents since 1991, and it's very clear this is the beating heart of democracy in Europe. So I'm hopeful that despite all this very complicated years since 1991, Ukraine and Europe will be in a union uh, in the future. Thank you very much, Yuri. Um, Konstantin, the next question is for you. One of the things that we like to do, one of the most useful things that we do with our indexes is to, to show graphs and to plot the data over periods of time and to compare the trends between countries or between countries and regions or between regions. And one of the striking things about Russia is how it has not closed the gap mm -hmm. with the European Union yeah. in either freedom or in prosperity. And recently, actually, we see a dip in both of them. Would you like to comment, please? And by the way, thank you for writing the, the, the Russia section in our atlas. I found it very illuminating. Um, thank you. I, I think the great thing that your index, uh, indices show is the gradual deterioration of uh, both political and economic freedoms. Because if you follow news coverage on Russia, then it's typically either Russia, Russia is totally a market economy, it's a hot place, everything is going well, Russia is winning, then it switches to Russia is collapsing, it is a catastrophe, Putin will be gone in a year. But the indices show that the uh, economic freedoms, a lot of achievements of 90s, they were gradually deteriorating over the Putin's rule. Since the, his first days in power, Putin was building an authoritarian state. And for some years, it sort of worked because, for example, they got rid of the common criminals. Mm -hmm. They uh, were getting rid of the criminals uh, who were s serving in the police force. So there was a period when it was good for growth. But then it was obvious that it would not because a personalistic dictatorship, it's not something that could, uh, that could ensure economic freedoms. So in the next 15 years, we've seen stealth nationalization. It was 
not very noticeable. It does not, it didn't always make headlines, but Russia nationalized more enterprises, I think, peacefully than any other country ever, certainly like the uh, most by the market value. And this, this thing is continued. And with time passing, as the indices shows, this was this has become a huge impediment for development because it appears that Putin friends who have pointed to all the important positions, they are no better for business than the common criminals of 90s. They're as greedy, they're as predatory. So eventually it deteriorated to the state when they made decision to invade Ukraine, which I think stopped most of the, most of the prospects of business development. Nowadays, they simply nationalize enterprises. Just yesterday, we had news about another arrest, another nationalization of a big enterprise that was, it was privatized in early 90s. It was just a metallurgy combinat. These are people who just made it work when everything was collapsing. Now, 30 years after that, they arrested. They will have to transfer their shares to the, um, I don't know, police state. Thank you. So Melinda, one of the things that you did at the uh, Eurasia Center when, uh, when, you, when you were here was to look at the interplay between the different countries in, in the region. One of the consequences of the 22 reinvasion of Ukraine has been that a lot of um, migrant workers that would, would go into Russia from the Central Asian republics mm -hmm. Uh, decided not to go there. What are the consequences in those regions from this development? Thanks, Dan. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. Thank you to you and Joseph and Fred for the chance to be here. Uh, so I have to say one thing before I, I jump into Central Asia. Uh, I have been banned by Russia twice, but I now have a new life goal of, of getting on the warrant list like Constantine. So yeah. thank you for I'll, I'll in, you inspiring me. Talking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll compare notes on this. Okay. So uh, Central Asian migration is, is really interesting because uh, several of the economies are very reliant on Russia. And they're reliant on the construction sector and also uh, in agriculture. So uh, I've been, Dan, looking at at sort of the knock-on effects. We, we know how the wars affected Ukraine and Russia and the EU, and we can speak about that. But what does it mean in places that don't get as much attention, like Tajikistan or Kyrgyzstan? So before the war, Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan received more than 30% of their GDP in labor remittances. So this was people uh, from Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan who had gone to Russia doing low-level jobs that other Russian citizens didn't want to do. So in 22, the World Bank made some predictions, and they thought that remittances would massively drop because of the war. But they found the opposite, actually. They found that remittances in 22 reached record highs due to increased demand for labor and the Russian ruble's appreciation relative to the U.S. dollar. Analysts were speculating that these Central Asian migrants would also relocate to South Korea, the UK, and Kazakhstan, but they haven't. So that's sort of the, the surprise that I found. Uh, there's a lot of complicated dynamics. There's also a lot of Russians who've moved to Kazakhstan in particular, uh, and also to Uzbekistan to try to get away from the draft. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. So, so Simeon, <clears throat> one of the observations regarding trends in Europe um, is that while the freedoms um, of, um, of Europe seem to be secure, I mean, there are elections everywhere, and governments come and go as things should be, but there are serious challenges to the prosperity outlook for Europe. Mm -hmm. Could you comment on that, please? There are serious uh, challenges to the, to the, to the outlook, um, partly because um, um, of a demographic issue, so mm. Europe more so than any other continent or uh, set of uh, set of um, uh, countries is uh, is aging, um, and various attempts to address this issue either through technology, as Daron was uh, mentioning, or through some sort of uh, meaningful policy on um, on uh, migration has not not developed well has met uh, has met a lot of uh, uh, of uh, resistance 
So the conversation has been going on for some time. What are the productivity le levers? How can Europe become more productive with fewer um, with uh, fewer people? Better technology. There was a lot of hope on uh, so-called green technology, so that addressing climate change, Europe somehow will heavily invest in. Um, uh, greener and better technology. Incidentally, the war in Ukraine has completely stopped this, and I would mm -hmm. say reversed this uh, conversation as countries that were previously saying before the war, this is our path, now are saying we first need to sort out assistance to Ukraine and how our own security, we're discussing security in Ukraine, we should also discuss security in Europe, which uh, costs a lot. Europe has uh, historically depended a lot on the United States mm -hmm. for its uh, security for decades, not uh, just recently. And now it's uh, coming up to the fore that uh, a significant increase in um, uh, in essentially defense budgets has to happen, not just for helping Ukraine, but for helping Europe uh, uh, itself. And that is facing the reality, I thought we were talking about productivity, but now we actually need these uh, other tasks to deal with. Uh, First, which is why I would say the prosperity topic has taken uh, again a back, uh, a back seat. Europe, incidentally, as a structure of institutions, is not very good at multitasking. So at most, you can focus on one topic, um, uh, just the structure of Brussels, the structure between national and uh, regional um, uh, institutions as such, but you cannot really do the war in Ukraine and uh, prosperity. So now I think, I, to summarize it briefly, the future prosperity in Europe depends on how successful we are in Ukraine. If we are successful in Ukraine, prosperity would come as a topic, and I think we'll have a more elevated view on it, but not now. Interesting, thank you. So Yuri, next question to you. <clears throat> as I mentioned before, we've done some work um, in our center on the effect of joining the European Union has on the prosperity of countries. So uh, the United Kingdom can afford to Brexit uh, because they have a lot of institutions <coughs> that function well. But it, what we found was that um, in the former communist countries, the effect of joining uh, and even of being a candidate member of the European Union has had a very beneficial effect in improving the institutions. Can you tell me what we should expect in Ukraine now that Ukraine is a candidate to the European Union? Yes, thank you. We should expect lots and lots of positive things uh, from even candidacy status, not, mm -hmm. not just you know joining the European Union. Uh, even this pro prospect of joining the European Union can open access to technologies, capital, uh, markets. It's also going to give an institutional anchor. We see this happen in Poland, in Hungary, in many other countries. Um, so Ukraine will undergo a massive wave of modernization, and that's going to be very helpful for the country. Uh, but to be clear, this is a two-way street. It's really a win-win situation for everybody. Western Europe uh, benefited a lot from uh, Eastern Europe, Bulgaria, Poland, Romania, and so on, uh, joining the Union. Uh, Ukraine will be an equally important um, success story for the European Union because Ukraine has so much uh, to offer. Uh, like think about lots and lots of things: food security, uh, zero carbon energy, many other things. For example, you know Europe has struggled to develop its own IT cluster uh, that can rival you know China or Silicon Valley here in the U.S. And uh, Ukraine has a very dynamic IT cluster, you know, a very very good one. And uh, so it doesn't have to be a wild west, if you will, to develop this IT uh, cluster. It can be wild east. You know, Ukraine can be the Silicon Valley because, for example, many people don't know, but number one export from Ukraine to the United States is not food, is not steel, it's IT services. Mm -hmm. And so this can be a role for Ukraine in the future European Union. Um, one thing I would like to add is that this union is not going to be complete <clears throat> until Ukraine joins NATO because NATO can offer security and uh, a guarantee that Russia is not going to invade Ukraine anytime soon. If this guarantee is not there, Ukraine is not going to be an investable country. People and capital will leave the country because they will always have to live in the shadow of Russian aggression. And that's why NATO membership is so critical uh, 
for Ukraine and for, for the European Union. Because again, this is really a win-win situation. Ukraine can offer so much to European security. Uh, clearly, European countries are not ready to handle Russia at this stage, but Ukraine is, and we should use this opportunity. Thank you, Yuri. Um, Konstantin, in your um, chapter um, in the Atlas, you talk about how um, a number of tensions and uh, problems that existed in Putin's Russia have been exacerbated by the invasion of Ukraine. Can you tell us more about that? Uh, okay, I, I do not know what is going to happen uh, on the battlefield, although I think that Ukraine, uh, Ukraine will prevail. But certainly, as a model of economic development, as a model of building prosperity, Putin's model has already already failed and failed spectacularly. So there is like no doubt that there will be a huge disruption after the war ended and the Putin regime uh, regime collapses. So basically what Putin built now uh, is based on a huge militarization of every decision making. Military decides what is what is being done in the business. Security services see, have their people in every every business, everything is subordinated to this war. Also domestically, the regime uh, operates at the level of repression. Tens of thousands of Russians were arrested in anti-war protests. Thousands are in jail. And the thing is that Putin has no means to de-escalate this. Like mm -hmm. up until the end, they will keep arresting people. Mm -hmm. uh, they will keep uh, killing people. So I think like now people, um, some people say that Putin is strong because he can bomb Ukrainians because he commands huge armies because he could kill people in jail and put them in jail as he killed uh, my friend Alexei, as I'm sure uh, Alexei Navalny was killed uh, on his orders um, a week ago. But Putin is also weak because he's uh, he's sort of cornered. He's he cannot he cannot de-escalate and the country cannot live in a state of this like total militarization and hyster hysteria. So I think uh, it's there will be a new Russia, there will be a new transition. We will have round tables about this future <laughs> economic reforms and how to help Russia out of this, but it's in the future. Thank you, Konstantin. So Melinda, you told me that one of the things you've been researching recently has been the impact on the human capital mm -hmm. in Ukraine of both the COVID crisis mm -hmm. and the war. So please share this with us. Great, so Yuri, I wanna congratulate you on your chapter. I thought it was really excellent. And the statistic that jumped out at me uh, the most was that you found that Ukrainian children may make 20% less as a result of the war. And I think that's a horrifying statistic. Uh, and I, I, I started to think about it a bit more, and I think there's more pieces too uh, that are worth discussing. So I think you're 100% right that this is a big problem, but also access to in-person education depends very heavily on where you are in Ukraine right now. So if you're in the West, you're probably in person and taking lessons with a teacher. But if you're very close to the front line, you, you don't have uh, in-person classes, you're probably at home, uh, and your overhaul, your overhaul likelihood of prosperity is gonna go down. I went to Zaporizhia, which is on the front line, uh, in October, and all schools, Dan, in that oblast are closed. They don't have bomb shelters. So that, that's a, a big issue is access I, to education. Could I in intervene and say that you could donate to Kiev School of Economics Foundations that builds bomb shelters to schools so that they can operate? You absolutely can. So I went to Kiev School of Economics and Timofey Milovanov is gonna thank us for, for this intervention. Yeah, they build it like $5,000 and there is a new bomb shelter and the school can operate daily for, for But kids. this is the new reality that Ukrainians are living in. So Kiev School of Economics is one of the best institutions to do a real economic education. It, it, it's like, it's like London School of Economics, but in Kiev. Uh, and they've created eight bomb shelters underground. So during bomb raids, uh, bachelor students and master's students, PhD students can take their classes with wonderful distinguished professors like yeah. these guys. I, I, taught, I taught a class in the bomb shelter last <laughs> March. There you go. Uh, Kostya is going, sorry, for two months teaching next month there. So good luck, Kostya. 
Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. But overall, the, the picture of Ukraine's economy is changing. So after 22, we expected a big drop, and it dropped 29%. Uh, last year, though, it grew about 5%. And the reason why is the harvest was better than they expected. There was a lot of government spending, and there was improved electricity. And I think that's sort of an interesting mm. finding. People can get online, and they can, they can participate in the workforce because they have that Internet access. And I, I, as Yuri highlighted, this is an economy me where there's a lot of really smart people and there's a lot of high tech talent. But I think there's, uh, Yuri, there's two other things that I would encourage you maybe next year to include uh, that I'm worried about beyond educational access and those, those long-term perspectives for the Ukrainian labor market. I'm worried about landmines. We know that landmines really retard economic development. Ukraine is the most heavily mined country in the world today, worse than Afghanistan and Iraq. It covers, mines cover one third of the territory. Globsec in Slovakia says that it will take 757 years to clear the land through traditional methods. Ukraine is really smart though, and they're using AI, and Ukrainian farmers are building homemade uh, tractors to, to remove the, these mines. The other worry that I have, Yuri, is demography, and I know this is on your mind too, before the war, Ukraine didn't have enough people. They weren't even at replacement levels. And after the war, at least six million people have moved abroad. And when you talk to people, they tell you objection one, two, and three to returning is security. Thank you. Um, well, you know, there was this, this, um, this line from uh, Monty Python that says, and now for something totally different. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't want to let this opportunity with the audience here and the audience virtually. Um, Simeon's insights, because you've been involved with our indexes for such a long time, on one of the, the, the most important issues having to do with our results, which is it's very clear that the correlation between freedom and prosperity is very high. But the question is still always there on the direction of causality. Mm -hmm. Is it going from freedom to prosperity, or is it going from prosperity to freedom? And you wrote in the overview to the Atlas some comments on that, but it's nothing like hearing it from the professor talking himself. So the floor is yours. No, thank you. And actually, Daron touched upon this, mm -hmm. uh, this topic with his figures, where he was showing over time how some countries that start uh, authoritarian and then turn democratic, so after the difference, what happens. So in this uh, book that uh, is, I think, online already, so everybody can uh, access it, we have uh, at the beginning um, um, a figure, figure three, to be exact which basically does what Daron was showing us, but globally, uh, which is to show when uh, liberties change or, or when you become freer or actually less free, so in either direction, what happens to prosperity. So economists call this difference in differences. So you're not looking at the trend over time, you're looking at when a country changes or countries change, what happens to their prosperity and also over time. And we find a very strong correlation between if uh, we see changes in, um, in freedoms with some delay, we also uh, see uh, improvements uh, in, um, or changes, I should say, in prosperity because it goes in both directions then. So we've been talking about uh, recession in freedoms. Uh, there are some countries that improve, and we applaud that, but there are a number of countries, we're talking about Russia, but Venezuela, mm -hmm. which are a number of countries in the world, uh, Pakistan, have, uh, we have seen uh, significant deterioration in freedoms and then as a result uh, in prosperity. But using this difference in difference uh, methodology, uh, I think is what uh, gives us, uh, gives us uh, some, uh, some uh, solace, some hope that our uh, analysis really flows from changes in freedoms to uh, changes in uh, prosperity. When you try the opposite of saying, well, maybe Maybe uh, you first change prosperity, and certainly in economics, in political science, there are such theories that you first need to reach a certain level of prosperity to kind of have the luxury of thinking about uh, freedoms. So if you reverse the difference and say, does change in prosperity change freedoms? And the answer there is no. 
uh, or it's at least not, uh, not statistically significant. So that methodology that we do use in the Atlas, and which actually Daron and his colleagues have used very successfully, is gives us some, um, some hope, actually, for, uh, for the world or for the topics that we're discussing now, and some security in, the, in our findings. Great. Thank you. Um, so we have six more minutes in, um, in this panel. One of the things that uh, fascinate me, I would love to ask Konstantin this question. Uh, a very large number of talented people have mm. fled Russia mm. um, after the invasion of uh, Ukraine. There were people leaving Russia before mm -hmm. also, uh, but the war has accentuated this trend. And I think clearly long term the effect is severe, but I would think even short term. So could you comment no, on that? I, I think there is a hu huge effect. The thing is that since the beginning of the war, there are different estimates, but about a million mm -hmm. Russians uh, left Russia, became uh, refugees uh, in other countries. And Russian cities are not being bombed. Russian, Russian, uh, there are no tanks on the Russian soil, so it's not like uh, refugees from Ukraine. These are people who are running from peaceful countries. Perhaps hundreds of thousands, or maybe two hundred of thousands, are people who are just running from the draft. But others, for example, my peers, no, they are not going to be drafted. But people do not want to be associated with this. And in the science, in uh, education, it's like a totally devastating. So like mm -hmm. uh, in my profession in economics, I think more than half of people who ever published in international journals lived in within these two, mm -hmm. two years and we do not know how much of the, those who stay are living. The same thing in physics, in mathematics. I, um, when I was living in Moscow, I worked part-time in a high school for many years uh, thousands of teachers left Russia. Mm -hmm. Now, people whom were trying to help in Europe, there are new, like four new schools in one city in Montenegro, four new Russian schools. Mm -hmm. There are new Russian schools in Berlin, in Cyprus, and because there is so much talent living, and these mm -hmm. people will not come back. So this is actually, it's worse than 1990 and 1991. So the Russian science was larger then, but it's more people proportionally and in absolute numbers who left because of the, of the war. Thank you, Konstantin. So, Yuri, in the last three minutes here, the, the, the question on, on Ukraine, obviously all freedom-loving people are, wish the best for Ukraine in this, in this struggle. Unfortunately, the war may drag on, and one of the consequences of that is that people who have left may not return because they make a life in a different country. They make a life in, in Germany, they make a life in, in Poland. Or I'm sure you've thought about this. What would you say about the, the risk that as the war drags on, the effect on patriotic Ukrainians may be that it will be more difficult to return? It is a very difficult question. But as Melinda said, you know, the number one, number two, and number three concern about a factor that determines this choice, you know, to return or not to return is security. If you have peace in Ukraine, if you have security, people will return. And as many as 80% of people, refugees in European and other countries, say that when the conditions are right, they will return to Ukraine. Mm. Uh, but for this to happen, as I said, you have to have security, you have to have some other conditions. For example, you have to have housing. You know, people have to have a home to return to. And this is a big concern because 8% of housing stock in Ukraine is destroyed. It's, it's millions and millions and millions of people are, who are affected by this. And so we have to not only reach peace, but we also have to have conditions for those people to return. They have to have a job, they have to have a home. And this is where Ukraine is going to need its allies, its friends, uh, to, to recover from this you know, very uh, unspeakable tragedy. Well, this panel is not only brilliant in its intellect, but also on time. <laughs> so uh, we are precisely one minute before. Time for me to thank you all.
thank you very much, Constantine, Simeon, Melinda, and thank you very much, uh, Yuri. And this concludes the panel that we had right now. Thank you so much, all. Thank you.